Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum to everyone who's online, inshallah, and everyone who's joining us here today. If I could ask, inshallah, for all the brothers who are joining us, inshallah, just inshallah, makes it a lot easier. I don't have to look around here, over there, over here. Inshallah. I know, I know, I know. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you very much. Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Was salatu was salamu ala Rasulihi al Kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bi rahmatika ya arham rahimin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome everybody to our 10th class on the highest peak. And for everybody who's joining us online or from new folks here today, the aim of these classes and these court and these discussions that we're having is very simply is to uncover those breakthrough ideas, breakthrough lessons from the prophetic narrations of the Prophet ﷺ, and seeing how we can leverage them, utilize them, put them in action, so that we can attain our maximum potential in this life for the next. And I will say this because many a times when you look at the prophetic tradition or any real, we only look at it from kind of the spiritual lens. And there's no doubt there's, that is the main purpose, that is the main reason, and that is the main benefit that we will derive from these is our relationship with Allah. However, there's lots of benefit and lessons and ideas and breakthrough lessons that really if we looked at them from different lenses and we applied them to our personal lives, our professional lives, our relationships, any, any endeavors that we have in this life as well, we'll see the fruits of it. We'll see maximum benefit. We'll see so much khair and goodness out of it. Um, and it'll allow us to truly reach our utmost potential in this life and the next. Um, and so that's the aim of these classes here today. So we are going through the text, the famous uh, collection by Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, in which he has collected uh, 42 statements of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are number two. We're on the hadith number two. And this is the famous hadith of Jibreel, in which Jibreel alayhi salam, he comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, obviously not as Jibreel, but as, a, as disguised as a man, as an individual. Um, and he comes and he asks the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam those famous, those very important questions. Akhbirni uh, anil Islam, he says first, inform me about Islam. And so the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells him, Islam is that you testify that there's no deity worthy of worship but Allah. That you establish the salah, that you fa pay your zakah, that you fast in the month of Ramadan, and that you do hajj if you have the ability to do so. And then he asked, Akhbirni anil iman, tell me about faith. And so he said, faith is that you believe in Allah, you believe in the angels, you believe in the uh, books, you believe in the prophets, you believe in the day of judgment, and you believe in qadr, both the good and the bad of it. And then he said, akhbirni anil ihsan, tell me about uh, excellence. Tell me about excellence. And so that's where we are right now, still in this hadith, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he replied, an ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tara. Right, that... Excellence, ihsan, is to worship Allah as though you see Him. It's to worship Allah as though you see Him. And although you cannot see Him, know that He sees you. Know that He sees you. And so here, what we've discussed so far is the idea of Islam. And Islam is talking about, when we think about Islam, we're talking about the bodily actions. The outer external realities of what Islam calls for. So these are things, Islam are things like establishing our prayer. Islam is things like giving our zakah because these are things that are done externally. Islam, these are the main pillars of Islam. But Islam is also doing good to your neighbors. Right? Islam is also opening the door open for people. Islam is also um, helping someone in need. Right? Islam is also the idea of being dutiful to your parents. These are all actions that we do externally. These are external actions. So you can think of Islam as the actions. Speech, limbs, anything that we do external is Islam. Then the Prophet ﷺ explained to us what Iman is. And Iman was faith. Faith are the pillars, the ideas, the concepts 
the realities, the unseen realities that are our inner actions, our inner beliefs and our inner concepts that require, that are kind of fundamental building blocks for us to be able to really make sense of those actions that we do. Right? And we said last class that one of the functions of Islam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Islam or He gave us Islam for the benefit of our bodies. And He gave us Iman, faith, for the benefit of our minds and our heart. And then He gave us Ihsan, He gave us worship, this idea of attaining excellence for the benefit of our soul. For the benefit of... Because the reality is that Allah has created us, He's created us and He knows what we need more than anyone knows what we need. And so people can tell us, you need to eat this, you need to drink this, you need to do this much exercise, you need to do that much exercise, you need to... You know, people all over can tell us the things that we need. But that's only from a lens of our body. There's two other fundamental parts that make us who we are that people cannot account for. The faith, and then our soul. So our mind, heart, and our soul. And these are things which come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? These are the realities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with. And the only way we're ever able to really maximize our true potential. And I don't mean potential as potential in this life. I mean potential as a human being. Right? Our maximum potential as a human being for what we've been created for is to recognize the importance of the soul. Is to recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, وَمَا خَلَقُتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That we have not created jinn or mankind except to worship me. And this is the pinnacle of excellence. This is the pinnacle of ihsan. This is the, this is the, you know, there's many different, um, so there's, I'll back up. So there's actions, there's beliefs, and then there's our identity or the purpose, or our goals, you could say. Actions, beliefs, actions, goals, purpose. Right? So you can think of actions as Islam, our beliefs as Iman, and the purpose and our identity as Ihsan. Now in life, we have many different identities. We have many different roles. Right? Where some of us are students, that's our identity. We identify as a son, that's our identity. We identify as a Muslim, that is our identity. We identify as uh, maybe an athlete, that's a part of our identity. Right? These are things that we identify with. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obviously is not telling us everything. He's telling us the pinnacle. The pinnacle of our identity as a human being is to worship Allah as though we see Him. And although we cannot see Him, know that He sees us. That's the pinnacle. That is the height of our identity, of who we are. We are slaves and we are worshippers of Allah. That's the height. And that's why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He refers to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He always is joined with this title of abd, with the title of slave. And this isn't, this isn't um, demonizing, this isn't to lower the grade of the Prophet sallallahu This is actually to raise the standard and the status of the Prophet ﷺ. Because a slave means someone who's actually a slave in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is someone who's actually carrying out their fullest uh, reason of creation. That's sin. And so we find then, you can actually, if you think about it, this idea, right? So you have your identity, and the way we kind of justify our identity is with our beliefs and our actions. You're a worshiper of God. This is the height of our identity. The height of our purpose in life is to worship Allah as though we see Him. That's our identity. The way we bring that to fruition, the way we bring that into reality in our life is through our beliefs and is through the actions that we employ every single day. Those are what come together. And this is actually... You, this, this is definitely something that is, transcends just our faith and religion. This, this is a life principle. 
if you want to understand, because actually a lot of things that we do, we might, like for instance, you know, take an example of uh, someone who's having problems, maybe he smokes or she smokes. They're having a problem letting go of this, this, this issue of smoking. And no matter what they've done, no matter what they've tried, they can't let it go. And so one, uh, many a times actually the reason is because, not actually a lot of times, but sometimes the reason is because if someone identifies themselves as a smoker, if I say I am a smoker, in my mind, and my beliefs, I believe I am a smoker, then it doesn't matter. Right? It doesn't matter how many times I put in strategies to change my behaviors. I put a patch on, I go to the doctor, I do, go cold turn. It doesn't matter because my belief as who I am is that I am a smoker. So the idea is that if you really want to rectify your actions, look to your identity, look to the beliefs, look to the things that you make up your actions. So you're having problems praying, you're having problems, you know, attaining closeness to Allah, okay, then really ask yourself, how do you identify yourself? Not, I'm not saying like outside and like when you're talking, but I'm saying like really, when you're just in your own thoughts, how do you view yourself? When, if you were to say, I am, what would you fill that in with? You know, sometimes if you really start uncovering these things, this is where... You know, you, you might have this idea where someone believes they're hell-bent on thinking that they're a sinner. And because they've identified with that reality, it doesn't matter what they do, they just continuously sin. Because they, the whole, oh, if I'm already doomed to go to hellfire, then what's the point of me doing anything good? Because they've already made up in their mind that I'm a sinner and I'm going to go to the hellfire. They've already made up that identity for themselves. So the point being here is that look to what you're identifying yourself as. And the height of our identity is actually in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us through the, through the tongue of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is as worshippers of God. As worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the, the, the peak of our identity, the peak of who we are. And worship on this note, Worship isn't just, like there's a reason the concept of worship is mentioned in separately from prayer, from zakah, from hajj, from all these things. There's a reason. Because those actions, they're just, they're like, they're, they're the bare minimum. Like they are the absolute bare minimum that is required for us to maintain our Islam. The absolute bare minimum. Right? And worship though, is because these things happen, like if you think about it, salah happens, what? Are you praying every single moment of the day? No. You're praying five times a day. Fasting once a month. I mean one month in a year. You're not doing it every day. Right? Hajj once in a lifetime. Right? And so all the five pillars, you'll notice that these are things that they're just actions we do, some portions. The most things we do is we pray five times a day. But everything else is just once in a month, once in a year, once in a lifetime, once, you know, you, do, you say your shahada once. As in the requirements to become Muslim, you say it once. Right? These are not things that you have to continue to see over and over and over, although you can to renew your faith and things like that, that's fine. Worship is a little different. Although that is worship, but the concept of ibadah, the concept of ihsan in our ibadah, is that it's not a it's a it's it's a hal, not a maqam, as they say. What that means is that ihsan in our worship is a state, meaning it's not just something we do once in a while. It's not just oh today I'm just going to worship and that's it, and then no no no. If you identify yourself as a worshiper of God and you recognize this is the most important thing I can do in my life and this is the purpose for which I've been created, then you recognize right, the importance of that reality then, of worship. And worship is at all points. Worship is when we wake up, 
Worship is how we deal with our families. Worship is as we're driving. Worship is when we're working. Worship, the concept of worship is 24-7. It's not just at certain points. It's a, it's a state of being. I am a worshiper of God as a state of being. So no matter what happens to me, what occasion, what circumstance, I will react in that fashion. As a worshiper of God. As my peak identity. As what is required. And so that, that's, that's in everything. Right? You're on the court, you're playing ball, or you're playing hockey, you're playing something, a sport, and you get angry. You get upset. You get frustrated. Your identity as a worshiper should come out. And it should stop you from swearing. It should stop you from getting overly angry and, upset, and, 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 and abusive maybe. Right? It should stop you from doing those things because of your identity as a worshiper. Obviously that has nothing to do with worship, i.e. in the typical sense. You're not praying, you're not, you're not doing anything there. But it conducts your actions. It, it hones your actions and your behaviors. And so, the scholars have talked about, you know, we, we said, Ihsan, excellence is to worship God or Allah as though you see Him. And although you cannot see Him, know that He sees you. Now, the scholars have typically, have talked about this in two different ways. One way is to say that these are actually two different stations. That to worship Allah as though you see Him is different. Meaning that's, that's the utma, that's the top layer. Is you conduct yourself in a way, in a manner throughout your life as if you see Allah 24-7. As if you are aware of Allah. You know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at every moment. You're proactively engaged with your relationship with Allah at every moment. And then the lower level still in the category of excellence, the lower level then is, if you're not able to do that, if you're not able to proactively engage with God, with Allah 24-7 throughout your life, then at least minimally know that He sees you. Minimally know that He is aware of you. And although there is merit to this, no doubt, as our scholars have talked about this in great detail, my my own inclination towards this is that you actually need both. Your reality is that our relationship with Allah is one of being proactive and one of being reactive. I.e. we have to have, and so you need both. You need this concept of worshipping Allah as though you see Him. Being aware of Allah as though you see Him. As, and we gave that example a few weeks ago, but it's, it's good to mention it here, is that you have an example of, let's say, of um, there's a sin that you're being called to, whether it's going to a party or drinking or something that's ahead of you. Now there's many different reasons you can stop yourself from going and committing that sin. One person says, I will not do that sin because I fear the punishment of God. Right? I fear the punishment of God. This is reactive. This is reactive. Think of this as a reactive approach. It's, per it's more reactive. I don't want to go because I face the reaction of what will happen on the Day of Judgment. The other person, there's another person who says, I will not commit that sin because I don't want to disappoint Allah. Because I don't want to disappoint God. So one is proactively engaging Allah. You're looking towards Allah and you're saying, Oh Allah, I don't want to displease you. That's why I don't want to do this sin. The other is saying, it's more reactionary. It's saying, you know what? I don't want to go to this because I don't want to face the punishment that is going to happen. Okay? So there's two different approaches there. But in reality, you need kind of both. You need both to balance yourself. Because you're not going to be able to realistically, we're not angels. You're not going to be able to engage Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 24-7 proactively. It's just, it's just not possible unless you're an angel, unless you're a prophet or a messenger. Right? These, are, these are high maqams. 
you can always aspire to, but there will always be times where things will be done upon you, and you need to react in a proper way. Right? You need to, either you will go to Allah, you will go to Allah, or Allah will have, make things happen to you. And you have to adjust accordingly. And you can still be in a state of ihsan both ways. Both ways. You're still in a state of ihsan. InshaAllah ta'ala. And this is actually, it's, it's, that's, it's um, this concept. And so the definition, just for those who are interested, there's the highest level that the scholars have talked about is mushahada, is to witness Allah. Is this concept of witnessing Allah, which is to worship Allah as though you see Him. The lower level is muraqaba, this idea of Allah watching us, being watchful that Allah is knowing the, of our actions and what He does and He can see us and everything. This proactive, reactive, proactive, reactive engagement in our life. Again, if you think about identity, beliefs, actions. Identity, beliefs, actions. If you have a goal, whatever your goal is, you know, maybe you want to become a scholar, maybe you want to become half of the Qur'an, maybe you want to just right now get into university, whatever your goal is right now, there is a proactive approach that you have to actually go out of your, you have to actually do something. You have to proactively go after it. You can't just sit around and do nothing. You have to proactively put the steps, put the measures in place to make that dream, that goal a reality. You have to go after it. You have to proactively engage it at all moments. But there's things then that'll happen to you that you have to then react, you have to react to it. Right? You might want to pursue uh, getting into a university, a, very, a specific university. But let's say you didn't get the marks, or you didn't pass the exam that you wanted to pass, or you didn't get the final grade that you wanted. So how are you going to react to that reality? Right? Either you can say, okay, I'm going to just give up my goal now. I don't want to do it anymore. Or you say, no, 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 I'm going to react by saying, okay, I just have to take the course again. Or I have to go do summer school, or I have to pop up my grades, whatever it is, right? But the idea is there's both components that are required for success. And both are required in our relationship of achieving excellence in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Now some of the relationships, and there's many nuances between these. So that's why it's hard to put these together in a succinct way. But one of the ideas that I want you to think about, and actually the, the verse is best kind of presents this, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents to us an ish, uh, a circumstance in the Qur'an. In Surah Hujarat, Allah lays out a very interesting circumstance that occurs. And Allah says, قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّ That the Arabs, the Bedouin Arabs, they came to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they said, we believe. They said, we have believed now. Right? قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّ That we are believers. Then the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to tell them, قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا You have not believed yet. Say to them, you have not believed yet. قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا Rather say to them, say that you have submitted. You have embraced Islam. أَسْلَمْنَا Right? You have embraced Islam. وَلَمْ يَدَخُلِ الْإِيمَانَ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ And rather, iman, faith has not entered your hearts yet. Faith has not entered your hearts yet. So here in this verse, Allah Himself subhanahu wa ta'ala is differentiating between the reality of actions and faith. That one can be a Muslim by merely actions in sense of when they first, if you think about it, when you first become a Muslim, what makes you a Muslim? It's an action, right? Ashhadu la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Now faith is something that develops. Right? Faith is now something that develops. You're going to have this relationship where actions are going to lead to faith. Faith is going to lead to more actions. Actions is going to lead to more faith. Faith is going to lead to more... It's, it's this loop that's going to keep going. But initially it's just action. And you can't expect that the moment you enter into Islam, or the moment you come into deen, or the moment you make the choice of saying, okay, you know what, I'm going to start practicing now. You know, I'm going to get my stuff together, I'm going to start practicing, I'm going to come closer to Allah. That, boom, like everything's going to change overnight. 
No, no, the Prophet ﷺ is making very clear that there is a progress. And Islam, it leads to iman, it leads to faith. And when that gets solidified, then that leads to ihsan inshaAllah ta'ala. Then that leads to faith inshaAllah ta'ala. I mean ihsan. Um, and so, this actually brings up a very important point. And that is that when we, a lot of times when we, um, you know, you go to school, you're learning, you go to university, you get presented constantly with this idea that you have to believe. You have to put faith. Like you have to fully come to the conclusion first and then act. Like this reality that you can't, like it doesn't make sense to act before you've fully grounded yourself in understanding and belief and figuring out what that thing is. But in reality, Islamically speaking, from a religious standpoint, we're told to act first. We're told to act first. Which ta'ala by His will, if we're sincere in that action, it will lead us to faith. So it's not 100% necessary that we have to understand the nuances of every single thing in front of us to accept it. That's a, that's a concept that we learn here. And, the, and, and, and that's because of the approach that many of the academics take in, this, in these lands. But that's not required in faith, in religion, in Allah's religion. Right? Because the reality is that the action leads to faith. Actions, they lead to faith. Submission to Allah lead to us to faith. And we rationally, our minds, and we discussed this when we first began, our minds are limited. And it's a function that Allah has given us to begin with. Right? The minds and the intellect that Allah has given, this is something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And it's not necessary that Allah will open up the doors of our intellect, our heart and our mind, just on its own. That many a times it's actually the process of worship. It's the process of submission that opens up our heart and our minds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to faith. And so that loop needs to be established. You might be thinking, oh, but I don't understand this. Just do it. If you believe in Allah and His Messenger, you don't have to understand the intricacies of... You can learn that definitely. But submit. Submit yourself to Allah. And through that process, you will see how you will gain. Right? But you have to submit. That's the whole idea. Right? You have to submit yourself to Allah. There is no way around that one. We are, again, it goes back to identity. Who is the slave and who is the master? Who is the one who is owned and who is the owner? Right? And once we understand the reality that we are the owned and Allah is the owner. Allah is the master and we are the slaves. We understand that dynamic then we can actually move forward in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is actually very nicely presented. There was an incident um, in which one of the companions of Prophet ﷺ, he was giving out um, uh, money from zakah. He was giving out, he was distributing zakah to the poor, to the people who needed it. And so the Prophet ﷺ, there was uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, who was one of the famous companions of the Prophet ﷺ, he was around. And he's watching the Prophet ﷺ kind of distribute the zakah, distribute the money, distribute the, the goods. And um, the Prophet ﷺ is giving out, giving out, giving out, giving out. And the Prophet, and Sa'ad, he says, and he notices to himself, and he says to himself that um, the Prophet ﷺ left a man, he didn't give money or didn't give some goods to a man who I thought was one of the best of believers amongst us who I believed was amongst the most faithful of believers. And so he goes to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, Ya Rasulullah, you left out so and so when he is amongst the best of faith, the most faithful of believers. The faithful of believers. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, or merely a Muslim. He replies back by saying, or he's merely a Muslim. And so Sa'ad then goes away, then he still he can't hold himself back. He says, Ya Rasulullah, you know, you left so and so. You know, and he's amongst the most faithful of believers in my eyes. The Prophet ﷺ repeats, he says, or merely a Muslim. And this happened a third time. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, or merely a Muslim. And then he said, 
it's possible that sometimes I give to a person, right? I give to a person and there's someone else who is more beloved to me. There's someone else who is more dearer to me. There's someone else who is more important to me. But I don't give it to them for fear that it will, it will take them to the hellfire. It will take them to the hellfire. The point being is here that the Prophet ﷺ is differentiated. Here Sa'ad is saying, O oh oh Prophet of Allah, I consider this man a faithful believer. The Prophet ﷺ is saying, or he's merely a Muslim. Meaning, the actions, the, the reality of faith, and who is a mu'min, who is a believer, who is a muhsin, is only in the sight of Allah. Is only in the sight of Allah. No one has authority on these lands to call any one of us a true believer or a faithful believer. Right? We, we are Muslims and we submit ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the reality. That's the thing that binds us together. But we can't, as soon as we, we can't go around making the statements of someone's beliefs or someone's you know, quality of worship in front of God, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not up to us. The only thing we're, we're able to assess is the actions which are apparent from the outside. That's the only thing we're able to assess. And this is why as soon as someone says, Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu wa Muhammad Rasulullah, even if we had incidences on the battlefield where one of the Sahabas was going to kill Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu, he was going to kill a disbeliever. And right before killing him, the man said, Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu wa Muhammad Rasulullah. Khalid radiallahu an, he, he didn't believe it. So he killed him. And the news got to the Prophet And the Prophet was irate. He was so angry with Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu an. He said, did you cut open his art to see if there was faith inside of it? Like how dare you kill someone after he has said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Right, so that statement in front of our eyes is enough that binds us together. Unless there's some actions which show us otherwise. Someone says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, he's a practicing, he's, he's trying his best to be a Muslim. Alhamdulillah, we, we embrace that. Unless there's actions which show that he is going contrary. If he leaves, for instance, and he says, you know what, I don't need to pray. Then, then we have to then there's something there. Because his actions are showing otherwise. Or he says, I don't need to pay zakah. Or she says, I I'm not going to pay zakah. Okay, then there's something going on. There's actions. They're making claims. They're showing externally the realities of faith. And so that's when you can separate. And you can, there's some actions that can be taken place. But up until then, we, we don't have the right. We don't have a right to judge. We don't have the right to impose. We, we, we embrace. And this was the way of the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we talked about this, but I'm, I'm going to mention it because we have a few more minutes. Is... Again, just I want to stress the importance of action. The importance of acting. The importance of not getting too caught into the idea that I need to understand and learn everything before acting. Yes, there's a process of learning and there's importance to learning and we have to learn. Right? Talibul ilmi faridatun ala kulli muslim, the Prophet said, right? That learning and the seeking of ilm is mandatory upon every Muslim and Muslima, the Prophet ﷺ said. Right? So the things that we require to practice our deen, we have to learn them. Right? We have to learn. We have to learn how to pray. We have to learn how to make wudu. We have to learn these things. We have to learn how to do business dealings. We have to learn how to, you know, transactions. We have to learn these things. There's no ways around that. But that not fully understanding the reality should never stop us from acting should never stop us from acting. Acting is the number one way to actually solidify an identity. Right? You might be saying to yourself, I can never be, I can never come closer to Allah. You know, or you might be in a state of despair, in a state of hopelessness. 
But no, okay, if you want to be, you, you've been, no, no, I'm, I'm, I am a worshiper of God. I am a worshiper of Allah. That is my identity. That's what the best way to put that, to actually firm and bring that, like, to cultivate that identity and to make it firm in your mind and into your being is by actually doing actions that are in line with that identity. And you, they don't have to be big actions, but you start small. You start small, but you do them consistently over. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ stressed consistent actions, even if they were small. Right? The best and most beloved of actions to the Prophet to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those actions that are consistent, even if they're small. Even if they're small. Because the reality of those small actions, they are firming up your identity. And once your identity is firm, you there's no budging. Then even if you make a mistake, you know that you're, what, what you have to do, that's going to be in line with that identity. Right? If you've identified yourself as a, mush, mus, as a worshiper of God, as a worshiper of God, as the, you know, that, that's my goal. Then even if you commit a mistake, you know that the thing that's in line with that identity is that I seek forgiveness from Allah. That I make tawbah to Allah. Right? You, you, then you have that. But for someone who doesn't have that identity strong, they might commit a sin and then feel hopeless and not know what to do. You see, so that's why, and this goes with everything, right? You want to be, and you know, a, an entrepreneur, you want to be a scholar, you want to be whatever, right? You have an identity, you have an athlete, you want to be a filmmaker, you want to, you know, be a millionaire, you want to be a wealthy, you want to, whatever the goal that you have, your identity that you want to attach yourself to, then realize the best way to firm up that identity is by start doing the actions. You start doing the small actions that are lined up with that identity. And then inshallah you'll be successful. Right? You want to be an academic, a scholar, you want to be, you know, you want to be known as someone who's smart or innovative or you want to produce, you want to do learning. You have to learn. Right? So start learning now, small bits at a time. Make it a habit to learn. Why is learning just something that we do for four years in university or two years after maybe for a master's and that's it? Right? But to, if your identity is someone as a learner, your identity is someone that wants to excel and produce and grow, then you know, the, one of the ways to match up with that identity is by consistently learning. Establish a routine of learning. Reading books, podcasts, whatever it is. Right? But you have that kind of flow. So actions is so important. Don't get lost into that grounds of just... Because it's very easy to get lost in just attaining and attaining information, especially in the world that we live in, where information is so readily available that you just want to get everything. You just want to eat up everything, you want to learn everything, you want to, you want to do that. Because it's so readily available. Anything you want to learn, you can learn it. But I will tell you, Wallahi, by Allah, there is no benefit to knowledge if it doesn't lead to action. There's no benefit. Right, the Prophet ﷺ used to make dua to Allah. Allahumma yasaluka ilma nafi'an. O oh Allah, grant me beneficial knowledge. What is beneficial knowledge? Knowledge that will actually turn to action. I mean, there's so much useless information out there, so we have to make that dua to Allah. We have to constantly make dua to Allah that He guides our knowledge because the knowledge that actually turns us into better worshippers of God, you know, to reach that highest state as human beings for what we've been created for. So don't undermine actions. Don't undermine it. It is, it is the bedrock. We have to act. You have to act. And the last thing I'll say is that recognize that this hadith also, it's subhanAllah, like there's so many gems that you can pull out of this hadith. There's so many things that you can pull out of this hadith. But it's so simple. It's so simple. Five pillars, articles of faith, worship God, Bismillah. Right? Like it, it's very simple. It's not complicated. Um, but if you're able to line those things up, your life becomes you're a lot more manageable, I should say. You're able to deal with a lot more than normal people can. No doubt about it. Right? Someone who has faith someone who has actions and they get go through trials and tribulations, they have a bedrock. 
They have belief in Allah. They have belief in Qadr. They have belief in these realities that help them through those times. And they, and they allow you to push forward. They will allow you to push forward beyond you know, the difficulties. And at the end of difficulties is growth. At the end of difficulties, right, Allah only tests us, He tries us. What's the purpose? To see which one of us is best in our deeds. And normally, right, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that the best, Allah tests those whom He loves the most. And the, the ones that were tested the most were the Prophets and Messengers. Why would Allah test those whom He loves the most? Because at the end of the test is growth. You become closer to Allah in your endeavors. Right? You become closer to Allah through your endeavors. If you're being tested in your faith and you overcome that, your faith is going to be much stronger than someone who wasn't tested like that. It's as simple as that. So going through that is very important. But the idea is that those need to line up. Identity, your identity as a worshiper needs to line up with your beliefs, which needs to line up with the behaviors and the actions that follow. Absolutely critical. And um, you know, I was listening to a uh, one of the, um, our brother uh, Hamza from I Era. He was doing a podcast, and I was listening to something he said, and it really it stuck with me. It was very it was a very deep thought. And the, the thing he was talking about was this idea that in reality, everybody around us, you included, me included, we are worshipping something. We're worshipping something. So when you're out on the streets, and the idea of calling people to the worship, the reality is everyone is worshipping something. They've taken something as a god as something that they obey, they love, they show shukr to, they, they, they comply, they, they submit themselves to more than anything. For some it's money, for some it's fame, for some it's health, for some it's wealth, for some it's you know, family, for some it's parents, for some it's children, for some it's houses. But different things, people are worshipping these things. And so the point of our, of, of our relationship with Allah is to say, and the point that... Allah gave us, you know, Quran and Allah sent the prophets and messengers to us was so that we can take humanity and ourselves away from the worship of all these things and worship and point them towards the worship of the one who's deserving of our worship, of Allah. Right? So rather than worshiping all these other things, which by necessity we would be doing if we're not worshiping Allah. If we're not slaves to Allah, we're slaves to something else. And so that's the point. And he mentioned this great line of poetry, which I, I wish that I get it. Yeah, so he said, there was a line of poetry that he mentioned by Iqbal, Muhammad Iqbal, who is a Pakistani poet. Or, yeah. And he said, this one prostration that you refuse, this one prostration that you refuse or that you find so difficult, frees you from a thousand other prostrations. And we started, remember if we thought, remember when we started the first hadith, the hadith of intentions. With this is reality. We said that it, if we can point our intentions and our worship and everything we do to Allah, we free ourselves from the shackles of the environment and from the people around us and the expectations that people have upon us and, 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 and the slavery to the people around us and the slavery to the environment around us. The only way we free ourselves from the slavery of that life and that reality is by becoming slaves to Allah. Becoming slaves to Allah. That's, that's the maqam, that's, that's the height right, of, of, of our being. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by His most beautiful and grandest of names that He, that he allows us to be and He creates for us the reality within us um, of becoming true, real, sincere worshippers of God. We ask Allah to give us the, the ability and the capabilities to truly reach that maqam of ihsan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our shortcomings and forgive us for our sins. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify the affairs of our brothers and sisters, wherever they may be. 
And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send His peace and His blessings upon our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashadu la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruk wa natubu alayk. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullahu khayran. Inshallah, that's it for now. If there's any questions, we can take that. If not, then uh, we can wrap up. Inshallah.